First of all, boundless abundance. Christoph Wolf, um, Wolf a great Bach uh, biographer and scholar, sums up what numerous scholars have noticed. I quote, the principle of elaboration determines like nothing else Bach's art and personal style, unquote. As far as this piece is concerned, never in the field of human music has so much been drawn out of so little for so many. I don't know if Churchill knew the piece, but even the most stiff upper lip British politician would have to gasp at what's going on here. Bach shows in this vast piece, the longest single continuous movement he ever wrote, uh, that latent in the most unpromising of material lies a dazzling abundance of possibilities. Joel Lester has analyzed the way in which the abundance of musical material arises from what he calls heightened intensifications. Indeed, even in these first four measures, Bach can barely contain himself. It starts with eight notes and quarter notes, some of them dotted. But before he's finished the theme, we get... He just can't resist that little twirl. He's using sixteenth notes by then. Three measures later, he can't resist in using 32nd notes, or as we say in Britain, demi-semi-quavers, those little, little notes at the top. Do you hear that? Already. This kind of elaboration or intensification happens within variations, within variations, not just between them, many times. Another example of the same process, many of the variations are in pairs, the second being an intensification of the first. Or again, you get an intensification in one parameter of the music, like, say, rhythm, and then it's, there's a corresponding relaxation of parameters, uh, of, of other parameters, like harmony or melody. And then things switch around the other way. In some places, a variation may kick something to the surface almost casually, which is then picked up and elaborated. In the D major section of the piece, that's the middle section, you remember, three notes are kicked almost casually to the surface, like bubbles in a bath. Well, you don't think probably that's the most promising material, exactly. It's only three little notes, not the sort of thing you're going to sing in the bath. But with Bach, even the bubbles aren't wasted. He becomes strangely captivated by these bubbles, indeed addicted to them. The notes become a motif which is repeated almost obsessively. And you'll notice then, those who do read music, what he's asking for in the lower ones, bottom right there, is for that A to be played on two strings at the same time. So you're playing it on the open A string, and you're also playing it five notes up on the D string. So he's now intensifying it even further to say, do you hear these? These notes are then expanded into, top right, four notes. <laughs> bum, 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 bum. Just play from the top. before Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, okay? Don't get confused about it. Long before. He's the other obsessive compulsive composer you've got to watch. And on it goes. To, and the uh, second line on the right there, what he's asking for there is what's called double stopping. That's playing on two strings at the same time. Now you're playing slightly different notes, but the rhythm is basically the same. And on it goes, over and over again. Until the end, there at the bottom, where I put the big ring, he's asked for three notes to be played simultaneously. Three strings. Now, actually, that's impossible on a violin. He's not worried about a detail like that. That's your problem. You're the violinist. I'm the composer. <laughs> he was a great violinist, actually. So you have to go like that in order to get all these notes in. And then the Bachian tour de force, what happens in the bar just after that big rhythm, you get this. After that big ring, rather, you get this. what appears to be a new melody. But of course, it's not a new melody. It is the three notes that have been the obsessive thing all along. What's more, you then realize, of course, they link up with the opening theme, 
the second measure of which has three notes of this sort. Absolutely extraordinary. Let's listen to the whole of that passage. This is again uh, Perlman from the top. takes a lot of practice. Only great, great musicians can play it quite like that. So there we are. We're dealing here with something that seems basic to Bach's way of working. His son, C.P.E. Bach, famously testified to how his father, J.S., used to hear the main theme of a fugue, very complex piece, played or sung by someone else, just the theme and nothing else at the beginning, predict what will be done with it, and then elbow his son gleefully when he was proved right at the end of the piece. Even at the end of this piece, the Chaconne, the music is by no means structured to give the impression that it has to stop when it does. There's no impression that the possibilities have been exhausted. Indeed, it doesn't really end at the right place at all. The standard way of ending a Chaconne at the time was with huge flourishes and flag waving of the sort you get at this point in the piece that I put with the arrow. But at this point in the piece, you think you're going to come to a nice minor close where you've been, and he suddenly effectively does this. And he starts the whole thing up again to say, not finished yet. And he's only halfway through the piece. Are you ready for more? The logic is open, the variations unmasterable, as if they were only examples of an infinite range of options. So it's not surprising that this has led some to speak of an infinity in these pieces. You listen to the erudite Bach scholar John Butt, by no means a Christian believer, a uh, delightful uh, person who's become a good friend, but, no, but certainly not a Christian. I quote, there is something utterly radical in the way that Bach's uncompromising exploration of musical possibility opens up potentials that seem to multiply as soon as the music begins. Remember what we found? By the joining up of the links in a seemingly closed universe of musical mechanism, a sense of infinity seems unwittingly to be provoked." Unquote. Or in another place, I quote again, what seems to be an enclosed world of predetermined connections can in fact imply an infinitude of possibilities. Now that would need a lot of careful qualifying, but cautiously we might say that insofar as this kind of music can be heard as an evocation of infinity, it is not the infinity of monotonous continuation, but much more akin to the infinity of proliferating novelty. And that, I would suggest, is the way to imagine God's desire for creation and, indeed, for what the Bible calls the new heaven and the new earth, the new creation at the end of time, when this whole created order will finally be liberated from its agonies and share in God's abundant life. How could that ever be dull? Because so fascinating, the church makes heaven dull and hell fascinating. People are much more fascinated in hell than they are in heaven. Very, very interesting, historically. <laughs> 